Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the OpenShift Commons. And today's OpenShift Commons briefing, we have a black belt with us, an OpenShift uh, DevOps black belt, um, Aaron Aldrich, who I'm sure many of you have heard and known on the airwaves here on the internet. Um, and he is going to tell us why there is no such thing as vanilla Kubernetes. And then um, when he's done doing that um, rant and talk, we will have a conversation with Jay Bloom, Sasha Rosenbaum, and myself, and anyone else who's joined us in this live broadcast across Twitch, YouTube, and the rest of the internet. So Aaron, introduce yourself, tell us all about yourself, and then justify that statement. <laughs> all right. Uh, so hi, everybody. Uh, I apologize, I don't have uh, Twitch up and running in front of me if folks are chatting there, so someone will have to communicate the chat to me if that's a thing that occurs while I'm uh, going through all this here. Um, but I'll, I'll get there. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've, I've done the wonderful thing of building a nice little who am I into my presentation so you get visual aid. Uh, so I am Aaron Aldridge, managed OpenShift Black Belt here at uh, Red Hat. Um, historically through a lot of things, I'm also tied into the DevOps Days community. I organize, uh, started the Hartford uh, event for that and have organized for uh, both New York City and Boston as well. So if you saw the Boston event uh, last year that was online, it was there. Um, I also host the Tabletop DevOps thing that also streams here on Twitch with using uh, Desert Island TV. Uh, care about some mental health uh, in tech is another corner that I will often be found speaking about. And uh, yes, my license plate actually says uh, DevOps, which is sort of shamelessly stolen from uh, Matt Stratton, uh, but he lives in a different state and his license plate changed to who pedal anyway, so it's fine. Um, so yes, yeah, so let's jump in uh, a little bit here and talk about uh, the Kubernetes landscape a little bit. And specifically we're talking about vanilla Kubernetes. So before I tell you that it doesn't exist, let's actually establish what it is uh, we're talking about, right? And uh, first things first, here it is, right? We found vanilla Kubernetes, already I'm lying to you. Um, no, but uh, to a little bit more seriously, this is the Kubernetes project, right? You can find it online. So uh, I don't mean that literally this thing doesn't actually exist in the world on the internet, but there's no real practical use for it. It doesn't, use, uh, doesn't really exist in practice. Um, so there's a reason people want vanilla Kubernetes and talk about it, right? Often the myth of vanilla Kubernetes is uh, portability, right? If you're built for just the upstream software package, you should be able to work everywhere. Um, maybe lock-in is a concern, so you don't want to be stuck with any one vendor. You want to be able to move around. Uh, and you want, you know, cutting-edge features, right? If you're consuming upstream, you don't have to wait for it to get packaged and, and shipped along. Um, but these don't really exist in practice. And so let's examine what, it, what Kubernetes really pertains to, right? Just running Kubernetes by itself already is going to take um, a bunch of different services, right? You, whether it's working specifically on the control plane or working on the node, uh, you, know, you have to make sure etcd is working, make sure your scheduler is running, you have a kube controller manager. If you're running in a cloud, right, you need the cloud controller manager so you can talk back to the cloud services APIs and, and understand all that. Uh, and that's all, you know, making sure you have your kubelet and your kube proxy, you're going to need all these other uh, services like DNS so everything knows where to talk to each other. Uh, even just container runtime is diving into uh, a question as well, right, which we can talk about a little bit uh, here. And, you know, all these different services as far as running it in production, right? You're going to care about your application logs, your application metrics. That's got to be figured out and implemented. Your storage layer, your networking. Uh, you know, there's load balancing built into Kubernetes, but how are you going to do that practically from uh, ingress coming in from outside your network or egress routing? It's all going to be figured out. Uh, you've got your underlying infrastructure, right? You're just choosing what type of metal to run it on or what's uh, involved in that is going to be a choice that has to be made. Uh, how do you want to automate that infrastructure? Are you going to use Ansible or are you using something else to do that? Uh, you've got to maintain that long term. As we all know, like infrastructure as code is sort of saying the same as eventual inconsistency, uh, right? So we've got to continue to maintain all of this stuff uh, that goes on for it. And we even have to make a choice like, Again, like I talk about container runtime, that's a choice, right? You don't start with a default container runtime. You have to choose, do you want container D? Do you want cryo? Uh, are you using Docker for it? Or actually Docker is not really, it's gonna be removed. We're not gonna support Docker shim anymore, but that's been pushed back a little bit further so you can still use it for right now. Uh, you know, and that caused a whole bunch of confusion online not too long ago. So uh, even just the core choice of like, 
where do I actually want my containers to operate uh, is something that's going to make your implementation of Kubernetes unique from somebody else's. Uh, so realistically, we don't have extreme portability. You've now got this custom-tuned infrastructure that can only run your, your apps, right? Because they're built for that environment that they live in. Uh, so that lock-in, yeah, you're not locked into any given vendor, but now any environment that you move to is going to have to look pretty similar to the one you're operating uh, that you've custom-built, right? You have to continue to custom-build that environment everywhere that you go. Uh, and now maybe you get the latest features, but that is for everything. It's also the latest vulnerabilities, the latest CVEs that you have to care, you care about, all the latest deprecation of packages. Like all of this now becomes your responsibility if you're actually running uh, vanilla Kubernetes. So all of the benefits that people aim for uh, get shifted away by, by the actual practical implementation, right? All the theory uh, sort of disappears once we run into reality. Uh, so the conversation that this ends up being is a lot more like build versus buy, right? This is uh, probably a conversation you've heard of before. I kind of hope people have uh, some experience and understanding of the build versus buy conversation because we do this all the time, right? This is not like a uh, completely unfamiliar concept. Uh, you may think about it, you do it every day, right? Think about just lunchtime. Do I go make myself lunch or do I go buy it? Um, and there's different trade-offs in that that we make. And I feel like we talk about it so much, it should be this sort of settled case law of like, okay, we understand the process. We know how to do this now. Uh, let's walk through every scenario. And I, I think we kind of do. Um, so let's actually examine this scenario, understand what our build cases and our buy cases are and, and kind of see it a little bit more closely. Um, build, right? So if we're building the software, this is the example of like our pure vanilla uh, straight tapped from the source Kubernetes, right? We're downloading compiling source might be the extreme example of building yourself. Uh, and this is like the same as, as thinking of like vanilla Linux, right? This would be like a custom compiled uh, distro that you're pulling right from source code. Uh, so the nice thing is you get ultimate freedom, right? You can choose every little detail. Everything can be custom built. It can work specifically for uh, the application or use case you have in mind. It's, it's built towards purpose, right? It can be uh, specially tuned there. Uh, the other side of freedom is always responsibility. Like if you've ever seen the, the Netflix culture deck, they talk a lot about freedom and responsibility. The two kind of go hand in hand. While you get that freedom to do and create whatever you want, you're also responsible to answer for it and why you made those choices. And you have to have deliberation and, um, and understand all, all of that, right? Uh, I think the line is like intention without strategy is, is chaos. And when you want to answer to your C-suite about like, hey, why did we choose this package? Uh, for implementing, you know, our, our run times. Like, why did we choose Docker if that's going to be deprecated? It seems like that was a lot of work. Like, it just felt right at the time is probably not going to be a great answer to deliver uh, in that conversation. So it requires a lot more thought and, and choice. Uh, and as we all know from, from open source, right, when you build it yourself, it's, it's free as in puppies, right? So there's uh, maybe no upfront cost. You can do it without paying a software vendor. You don't have to have a sales conversation or... Uh, procurement process, but what you're saving in that upfront cost, you're, you're shoving into implementation and learning, right? You've got engineers that now need to become experts. Uh, you've got care and feeding and maintenance that needs to happen. So that's kind of the, what the, the costs are of our, our build. Uh, and on the other side, you can buy it, right? And this is, again, just like a house, right? You can custom build a house. There's a lot of choices that have to be made, or you can build one that's already standing and you get all of the, uh, the information there. Uh, the example for extreme build uh, in our case, might be uh, managed services for OpenShift, something like Rosa that just launched uh, recently, Red Hat OpenShift uh, on Amazon, right? So this is often opinionated services. So when you're buying something off the shelf, all those implementation details have been chosen, right? Someone's made all those choices ahead of time. They might be the best choices for them or the best choices based on their experience in the industry. Um, but all those choices are supported and tested. They are, in fact, experts making those choices because they have implemented this and they're building it for multiple customers. Uh, you get some level of uh, being able to go back to, uh, in our case, Red Hat, uh, or you know whoever has built the product and say, hey, I'm having some challenges with it, can I get support? And they're testing it not only with their own internal experts, but all of their customers continue to test that software as well, right? Everyone is using the same implementation and the same implementation details. So we find those edge cases faster. Rather than being the only one who has this problem on the forum, maybe you're one of 10 or five, or you get the, yep, we're already aware, it's in the next patch type of response. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, the other side to buying it is it costs money. And sometimes it can be extremely expensive to buy a solution versus implementing it. Uh, and the other side of that, of course, right, you get that expertise, and it's also usually faster to implement. And you are buying part of that uh, part of that knowledge and part of the expertise is being purchased as well. It's um, an expertise that doesn't necessarily have to reside within your engineering organization at that point, right? You can you can buy that if you need. Um, so how do we examine this choice, right? Uh, first, obviously, we will have resource constraints. If you have more time than money, like that's always going to be uh, a factor. And I've been in those organizations, the nonprofits and the small organizations that really just cannot get the uh, the lump funding to buy a solution that they want. And so you're forced to sort of become experts and implement it at that point. And that's a different situation. Uh, largely what we're talking about here is if we're min-maxing our uh, organizational choices, if all things are created equal, how do we want to spend uh, money versus time? Uh, and the key here is always to focus on what sets you apart in the market. Like, why is your service special? Why is your company or your organization the best one to do what it is you're doing? Uh, that's the kind of stuff that you can't buy, right? Because that's what makes your organization unique, makes you special um, doing the thing that you do. So that's really where we want to spend time on. That's where we want to spend do uh, things built for purpose, things that are going to enhance your specialization are going to make you stand out and make you better. That's where time and building comes in. Because uh, you're not going to be able to buy an off-the-shelf product uh, that makes you unique, right? Red Hat couldn't buy an off-the-shelf operating system way back when and be Red Hat, right? They had to build their own implementation of uh, the Core GNU Linux operating system to become Red Hat, like to offer something to the market that's interesting. Um, but all the things like implementation details, whether it's how you host your applications or um, what's our process for delivering into production, a lot of times you can buy your way out of those decisions and pay someone else to be an expert. Uh, at the end of the day, you're probably, most uh, programmers in an organization aren't getting paid to be Kubernetes experts. They're getting paid to deliver value to their customers by way of their application, like quickly and efficiently and have it work every time. So all those implementation details if those can be, uh, if we can just buy our way out of those decisions in that time, we can start getting more ideas into production more faster, um, which is the technical term, more faster. Uh, so you can probably guess my answer to this almost always is buy, right? Especially if we're talking about something like infrastructure or Kubernetes, like buy your way out of making those decisions unless, like if this is not a core component of R. Um, of course, the exception that proves the rule, because I think this is a good story, is uh, the company Datadog. Uh, if you don't know Datadog, they're a SaaS uh, monitoring company, observability company. Uh, so, you know, you order a, a Datadog off the internet, you install clients on your machines, and they bill you per system that you have, you know, processing data, or you get billed for the data that you're keeping or, or processing. And I, I don't work for Datadog, so I'm not going to push them any further. Uh, but their implementation of, of Kubernetes is, is the example here. They have built it, and they are operating their own Kubernetes uh, for a reason, right? They made this choice strategically. Uh, part of it was their, because they're an infrastructure monitoring company, understanding how Kubernetes works and understanding the ins and outs and what you care about and what it looks like right before it falls over is extremely important to them, right? They want to know how their customers use this product so that they can offer a better product to their customers. So becoming experts in Kubernetes is actually something that gives them value. Uh, the other side of it is they started early enough in the, the, the life cycle of Kubernetes that there weren't services offered for it, right? There was sort of the project and maybe one or two distributions that existed, but largely uh, they were jumping in extremely early. They became for, you know, contributors to the project. Uh, I remember seeing the a couple of talks they gave here. So these are our two examples of some of the talks. They, they talked about the cost of it of, you know, Kubernetes the very hard way, right? If, if Kelsey Hightower's introduction is Kubernetes the hard way, they talked about actually practically doing that in production. Um, you know, the challenges they ran into, how many times DNS broke for them because it's always DNS, uh, how many times containers stopped being contained, right? All of these weird implementation details that you have, uh, the fact that they had to contribute to the core project in order to get the services that they needed, right? They had to actually build into Kubernetes the functionality they wanted because it wasn't there. Uh, so these are all things you take on if you choose to build it. Obviously, they had a good cause. It, it got them where they are now. Now they're operating extremely large, you know, 1,000, 2,000 node clusters uh, in production. And obviously, you know, their product works and they still have customers. So it worked out well for them.
Um, okay, great. So the exception that proves the rule, you're not Datadog. You're probably looking at buying uh, unless, again, unless, you know, offering that platform is, is core to your, your organization or you have other resource constraints. Uh, so what are our options, right? I mentioned distributions, and this is just like Linux, right? If Linux is vanilla, you got to build it all yourself, or you can get a distribution. You get to get it already built with a lot of uh, implementation details. Uh, Kubernetes has a certification, right? This certified Kubernetes. Uh, is making sure that any given distribution that has this stamp on it uh, is going to be compatible with the core project. So any application that should run in the core Kubernetes should run on anything that's certified Kubernetes. Effectively taking that vanilla purity test and, and making it meaningless, saying this distribution is fine, right? It passes the vanilla test. Um, so if we're going to certify fresh uh, some of our distributions, let's look at what we've got here. Uh, we have a number of distributions all over the place, whether it's OpenShift or Rancher or uh, AKS or what have you. Um, and of course, they're all certified, right? Why wouldn't you be? If you have a Kubernetes distribution, you have to be certified Kubernetes or no one is going to use it. Uh, so just this standard is already answering some of this purity test question. Um, here is the bit that they're talking about. This is sort of upstream Kubernetes. When we're certifying Kubernetes, this is the bit we're talking about. We're saying, whatever product we have here is compatible. Like it, it has all these components and they all work the exact same way uh, that we would expect them to. Uh, so taking a look at a distribution. So let's take a look at EKS, right? That runs Amazon's own version of uh, Kubernetes. And you can see they've added a lot of stuff around it. Some of it is how you get code in production. Some of it is just implementation details like where does my control plane live? How am I, what types of uh, systems is I, am I using? How else do I want to extend this? Uh, that's the type of stuff that gets stacked around it. It doesn't actually change the underlying compatibility of the application. It's still completely compatible with uh, Kubernetes and has that certified bit, right? Google Kubernetes engine, a uh, very similar process, right? As, as far as a cloud provider. And, and Google, right, the originator of Kubernetes as the board project, they're not using the pure product, right? They have implementation details that they've made. They have abstractions that they've made on top of that to make sure that they can get their monitoring and their storage uh, wired up to it properly to their services. Uh, and of course you have something like OpenShift, right? OpenShift's a little bit different because we have this productized, it doesn't just live in a cloud. It's also something that is a uh, deliverable product that someone can install on-prem. It kind of is a, does a little bit more than just the control plane. So you see here it kind of lives inside Kubernetes, but largely it's the same type of thing. You've got an OpenShift CLI that's compatible and an OpenShift API that's compatible with Kubernetes. You've got all these different bits that you can stack on uh, to either extend the stack, right, and get more functionality, or our implementation details just made for you so you don't have to continually make those decisions every time you roll out a new cluster. Um, so that's, that's that, right? Like we've got these products that are uh, certified fresh Kubernetes, and that sort of covers the, is this compatible with any other solution that I would build. And this is saying, yes, we're going to make these compatible with the core. So anything you build, if you want it to have that portability and want it to be useful, you're going to have to make sure your custom implementation of Kubernetes follows all these certified Kubernetes standards, or you're going to have uh, lock-in details that way. Um, so this also brings up a little bit of an interesting point that I want to get into with these different services. Uh, to go back a little bit, obviously, like I said, OpenShift is a little bit of a different product. And these are pretty much live in the managed service realm. Uh, and these things like, uh, you know, XKS services, GKE in this managed service realm sort of represents where I see everything going. So I want to take a minute, uh, look a little bit into the future, look at a map of where we're at and what's been happening with different technologies and see if we can sort of say, okay, given all of this, given the existing landscape of build versus buy and what's been happening, uh, can we see where things are going and what we're we're looking towards next? Um, so I think this is, I just read this article recently, and I think this is a great example of the evolution of uh, organizations and service offerings. And uh, this isn't about licensing and open source stuff, which is an entirely different discussion I'm happy to have, but not the point I want to I bring in uh, about this. The point here is largely about how MongoDB transformed their service offering to, to move down market, right? And so the shift is, do we wanna offer this product that requires handholding and installation to very large customers? They have to talk to our sales org in order to buy it. And we've got all this large process to implement your own MongoDB. Or do we just allow people to consume MongoDB on our cloud service, right? That's the shift towards uh, the individual, towards the ease of consumption 
uh, over, you know, making big deals and packaging it all up and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's been a shift. And what they found what this article gets into are some of the details where even though Mongo's average spend per customer has dropped, right? So each customer is spending less money on average with MongoDB. Uh, their revenue has doubled in that time. So what's happening is they have to be getting this extremely long tail of individual consumers, and everyone wants to move towards this. Uh, this is not just like a one-off example. This is how we've observed markets move. Uh, so this is kind of a take in an example of wordly mapping, which is, again, a, another whole thing uh, that we could get into and is not the scope of this talk. So I've, I've got some resources in my uh, slide deck that's published online, or I'm sure, sure uh, can be another part of the discussion. Um, but the gist we want to get at here is largely this, um, this red line is largely what looks like the x-axis from a Warbly map. It's always this move from uh, Genesis and custom build all the way through uh, commodity. And I'm waving my mouse around, although I have no idea if it's shared on the screen. So I may be like me uh, gesturing at nothing, but that's all right. I'll, I'll hope that it's useful for somebody. Uh, maybe I can do the pointer. There we go. Uh, Genesis over here, we move along the line towards commodity and utility. Um, this line and moving forward about that is all about changing the ease of consumption. Genesis is like very new products, right? This is when you want to design, have something that's purpose designed. I talked about this when you, when you go to building versus buying. Uh, your custom build can be designed for a very specific purpose and be very, very good at that. Uh, but it takes a lot of time to actually do it. Uh, we probably exist somewhere in this product commodity overlap nexus for Kubernetes right now. Uh, there are some products that you take and install at home, and there are some that are being hosted, and the cloud kind of asks a lot of questions about whether this is really rental or something you've bought. Um, I, I think we kind of lean more towards this area right now. Uh, and that's obviously designed for manufacturer, right? Our goal is to be able to, how can I get this out of the door consistently and get widespread distribution? But our move here is always towards consumption. We want the utility, just like movies move towards Netflix, right? It's really easy for me to swipe a credit card, go online and click the thing I want and get it instantly. I don't have to shop for it in a store. I don't have to make sure it's in stock. I can just get what I'm after. Uh, and compute has moved this way, right? We're no longer rack and stacking servers for, for like proof of concept. Maybe there's reasons to run stuff on prem, but for the most part, we're swiping a credit card, asking Amazon for a specific type of uh, compute and getting it delivered over the internet without really having to think about it or worry about it. Everything is shifting towards utility. MongoDB is showing that shift to services. The rise of SaaS software is doing that. Uh, so I think this is going to continue to go. Things like the XKE offerings uh, kind of live in this commodity utility consumption, but they exist only f largely for the control plane space. How you're actually implementing your worker nodes, how you're implementing your supply pipelines, your software delivery. Um, how do you want to implement observability in your stack? How do you want to do all this stuff? Where do you want to run it? All these questions that come up as the uh, sort of, okay, I've got a Kubernetes, now what? Those are gonna start shifting towards commodity. They're gonna be more opinionated implementations. Uh, we're starting to see this with like the OpenShift operators, right? Things that exist for, uh, can I set up a, um, you know, supply chain of software with a, a given pipeline that works for 80% of my use cases, uh, given utilities that tie in for 80% of my use cases. So for most applications, you just ask for a CI CD pipeline and, and get it out the door rather than having to custom build and make all these decisions yourself. Uh, so I think that's where it's going. I don't think I'm the only person that's uh, on board with this. Um, you know, Andrew Schaefer, I think this was 2019, so last year. Uh, <laughs> this is all time is a meaningless flat circle now. Uh, serverless is the target of every DevOps project. And he said this at, uh, you know, it was DevOps Days Atlanta. Um, Oh, my, my where it was got cut off here. Okay. Um, it was DevOps Days Atlanta, which also combined map camp, so worldly mapping, and serverless days. So it was actually a really apt opportunity to talk about this. Um, but this is absolutely the, the point. Like any DevOps project I've been a part of, the shift has always been towards uh, ease of consumption. We're going to start operationalizing everything, make sure we can get similar results consistently over time. So that's a lot of automation and all the stuff we talk about, getting rid of toil, and self-service, right? All that self-service is, is the aim. Uh, serverless being the ultimate end goal of, hey, as a developer, all I wanna do is consume, run my code for me. I wanna be able to give instructions to a system and have it do those instructions. 
Uh, I think low code, no code is, is the ultimate example of that, where I don't even have to learn how a computer talks. I just say, hey, here's my idea for doing some things. Go do that, please. Uh, and not have to worry about all the underlying uh, implementation details. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the direction it's all going. As we're going to continue to build this, we have to think about how can we operationalize our platform to deliver consistent results every time, uh, and where is it worth spending our time versus where is it worth uh, spending our money? Uh, again, more people that have the same I ideas. Uh, this is from a few years ago from Kelsey Hightower to even, you know, Kubernetes uh, enthusiast at Google. Uh, who said Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. It's a place to start, not the end game, right? And we're going to start seeing continued abstractions in those platforms being operationalized. Uh, so to bring it around, maybe the reason we can't find just plain vanilla Kubernetes practically in production uh, is that it isn't an ice cream, right? Kubernetes is a part of a Sunday, right? This is really what everyone is after. We want all of these components stuck together, uh, and just plain vanilla ice cream doesn't get us a whole Sunday. Uh, so thank you. That's the rambling rant that I have for you. I'd love to take, you know, uh, additional questions and chat with other folks to see where these ideas are interesting and people want to learn more. Otherwise, that's kind of my starting off point. Uh, and the speaking link at the top there, uh, this slide deck should be published with uh, the notes attached to it so folks can find it. Well, thank you, because that was one of the best um, explanations of the different varieties and the of Kubernetes that are out there. I still, now I want the Sunday. I don't just want chocolate <laughs> Kubernetes. I want the yeah, Sunday yeah. and it's Friday, so I'm gonna get me one. Um, I, a couple of interesting things um, popped into my head too. And if you pop back to the, the Wardley map. Um, yeah, yeah, let me go back have, to that. Just one of the things like, and, and especially the conversation you were having around MongoDB um, mm -hmm. as a service. Because one of the reasons I got into cloud um, ages ago, like eight or nine years ago, um, was Heroku, right? It was a utility. It was an amazing thing. And then it, it, everything, so it's almost, I, I kind of feel like we're having this back to the future realization um, that um, services as a utility um, and the ease of use piece is really one of the key things that's going to, one, make money for people, but also make people use this stuff because Kubernetes itself, the DIY vanilla stuff is um, you install it and then then what? You got to do so much else before you can get your WordPress app running. I mean, right. I, I, WordPress as an old evangelist was like the go-to thing that we always deployed to show people, hey, it's working, you know, back in right, the right, right. early days. Um, and Heroku had that down and did a, a whole lot of other things too. And so, you know, for me, I think a lot of um, this, and, and I love Wardley Maps, and we have done a number of talks on Wardley Maps um, with Ben Moser and other folks. So please, um, yes, always, always. Yeah, and the, actually, the, the the link to Ben Moser's uh, site, the link, I think it's learnwardleymaps.com or something like that, is yeah. uh, in the slide resources. So. <laughs> so yeah, so thank you. I think it really frames it. But I, but I also like just wonder, like, how come it took us this long to realize? That um, you know that it was the commodity side of it, you know, and and it, it kind of flipped the um, flipped the market again. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think my 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 take on it is largely that it's all uh, part of it's cyclical, right? That we have constantly emerging technologies of oh, here's an interesting and new way to do things, uh, and as that continues to um, commoditize, right, move towards and evolve towards a commodity. Um, and which is, you know, the direction of evolution are, as we've observed in the markets. Um, I think we're, we're able to start taking those and building them in new ways, build new abstractions that become new and novel. And then it starts all over again, right? Well, now this abstraction is custom built. And we have to implement it a certain way. And as we start to operationalize that and get good on it, we start to distribute it. And then we look at how can we operationalize it? What are the best practices to do it right and get it working time and time again? Um, so I think it's it's always this cycle as we shift between new technologies, right? I mean, ten years ago, Kubernetes wasn't a thing, so that's why it was, that's why we didn't do it. We didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know, and we don't know what the next thing is right. either. So, but yeah, it's yeah. always interesting to watch these cycles come and go. Um, and I'm really glad we're getting back to the commodity side because this in between stage is always awkward. Um, yeah, exactly. That's that's what it's the. Uh, We've got 13 competing standards, so we made a new one to unify them, and now we have 14 competing standards type of uh, implementations. Yeah, and it, it brings it back, and I think, Jabe, you, you wanted to, to talk a little bit about about the focus on the end users yeah, and switching this around a little bit. 
Yeah, I mean, I think like one of the interesting things to think about is, you know, um, especially in CNCF now, they're they're talking more about like understanding end users uh, um, mm -hmm. and, and servicing end users better uh, as as an open source community, right? And yeah. one of the things to say is that like that those end user communities don't stay stable; they move. And you know, part of the part of what the Wordly map is saying is that um, it's not just the product that matures. It's the expectations of the community that's using the product that matures as well. Um, yeah. And so I think that's like one of the interesting things to think about is, you know, as an open source community, what do we have to start thinking about um, in order to, to better service customers that are coming to expect commodity style, um, you know, consumption of things like Kubernetes? They're not, they're no longer, you know, like, you, well, you and I talked earlier, right? Like, yeah, yeah. No longer, it, it used to be perfectly like the people who were early adopters wanted to be able to run their own Kubernetes, and you know, late adopters don't want that. They want they want it to be handled for them. So, like, but what is the what is the open source community going to do about this? What do we what do we have to think about it if, as an open source community to to kind of shift or shape the product differently? I guess. Hmm. You know, I think that's actually that's a really good. Uh, point. I think that that answer gets right to it, right? It's all about who are your customers. And as, you know, an open source community, that can be a lot of different answers, right? Some of our customers might be those platforms that are doing those implementation. And so it might be, you know, some of that type of stuff that people who are doing the building uh, want and care about. Um, but as as well, right, there are people that just want to implement it and not have to worry about it. So that's that's ease of use is always something that's going to improve adoption and, and gain more widespread uh, yeah, I, mean, I think one right. of the like a hundred uh, uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, like a, a thousand people you paying paying you a hundred dollars or is just as good as one person paying you a hundred thousand, right? Yep, totally. I think one of the things that that like is is worth kind of exploring. No, or... hold on. I can I jump into the previous comment Absolutely. and like no, in fact, a, a thousand people paying you a hundred bucks is much better because you oh, yeah. depend on a single customer changing <laughs> their mind. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, absolutely. Actually, that's that's an even better point. Um, I think one of the like the things to think about as far as like what's different this time, um, you know, I, I like I think that platform as a service, that whole PaaS idea, and especially like self service uh, access to things, is is like from a from a different time than we're currently in. It's from an ITIL based kind of process driven version of platforming, whereas now like. Kubernetes isn't always being used like that anymore. Kubernetes is like a, a platform where people kind of can co-create things together that, that mm -hmm. it's not simply like give me access to a machine. Uh, you know, containers aren't like virtual machines in many ways. And so there's this weird way of thinking, I think, that we could argue that the commoditized version of Kubernetes will be more, would be, would be an evolution over a PaaS if it can continue to co-create value as a platform as opposed to just be self-service. If it degrades itself into simply a self-service platform, it will be, it'll just be, you know, another version of those access to primitives. If on the other hand, it keeps on evolving and shaping itself as a way in which the community can co-create value with end users and uh, you know, make a platform where there's real effective shared services, uh, it will be a different kind of commodity, I guess, is what I would say. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what I think about it. No, I think I think you've got something there, and I think that's where a lot of the value of something like OpenShift having its roots and and upstream all in open source uh, gives it a lot of advantage in that, right? There's the ability um, and, and the approach of how uh, it's shifting more towards, like, we want to implement new stuff, we're going to build an operator for that so that you get some way of, of doing that. It's providing both, you can do this totally custom if you want to, and you can implement this and you can work with the community to do something that works for your specific purpose and do something that's more purpose built. Uh, or if all you need is some generic, uh, I keep using pipelines because that's the other thing I've been working on lately. So they're just like floating around my head. You just need some generic CI CD pipeline. Here's our implementation of it, right? Use the operator. This will get you where you need to go 80% of the time. And for the other 20%, let's co-create value and actually build stuff. Uh, on this platform, and then maybe even operationalize that, right? So that, that can be repeatable for someone else that needs it. Uh, and it's, and it's, I think that, yeah, that, it's you know, that, that DevOps that, collab, right? That that to me like captures a lot of it because there's like 
without starting a religious open source war in the middle of this, um, you know, open source isn't just the licenses and it isn't just access to free stuff. That's not what the open right. source processes and methodologies that have been developed for a long time. Uh, Red Hat's contributed to a lot of this aren't just about creating free stuff. They're about how do we negotiate the best common set of features and functions mm -hmm. to put into uh, the thing that we're all working on together. And uh, that that is co-creation. That's what co-creation looks like. To the extent that we can kind of keep that community alive, we will keep alive the ability to kind of do that type of work. And then questions about how do you operationalize this thing become a separate set of questions, right? There's op the op op uh, operation of the thing. <laughs> there's the uh, development and kind of product manager of the thing. And I, I think it's worth kind of pointing out that there's differences there. And that um, even as we move towards something like a managed service style operation of this code, doesn't mean we have to degrade into, you know, again, a, uh, you know, self-service access to primitive resources version. Right, right, right. There's a, it can be sort of advanced combination of the two. Uh, yeah. And actually this is, it gets to what I think is, um, sort of core to the, the DevOps process, right? Kind of why I, I, I used this quote from, from Andrew Schaefer. Um, I, I was sort of thinking about this last night, getting the idea, like a lot of development is the process of like codifying the knowledge and building on it, right? We're gonna do a lot of discovery of how do I do a thing, and then I'm gonna capture that knowledge of how I do a thing so that I can just do that repeatedly over and over. Yep. Uh, and ops tend to live in this, what is the best way I can do this thing? And I'm gonna do a lot of research about like, what is the best way I can do this? I'm gonna figure out how to do it repeatedly, over and over again efficiently, but it often like until we had this marriage, like then it got lost, right? Then it was captured in that org. Maybe we wrote it down. Maybe we had a run book. Maybe we had a checklist. Maybe five people knew how to do it. Maybe it was a script that was poorly maintained on one sysadmin's laptop, right? Like this was how knowledge was codified until we had this great merger of like, hey, what if we learn the lessons from our, our friends across the street and start to like codify the knowledge that we've got? And like, this is what kind of builds that, right? So it's we build something and figure it out, then we operationalize it, then we codify that, and now we can start doing it again, right? We can start operationalizing this further and further. Absolutely. Sharing so knowledge I, back and forth of that whole process, right? I'm gonna play the devil's advocate to this whole, like, you know, goal slide and whatnot. I mean, like, I, <laughs> I spent a little bit of time in serverless community. I wrote, wrote a book on Azure Functions, you know, and for, for a little time, I thought that, you know, serverless was gonna be a big thing that's gonna solve a lot of problems. Um, and I don't know that I necessarily think that anymore. And I feel like there's there's this whole, um, like the idea is always automating everything, right? Like we always want to uh, sort of remove the human, I know Jay will like this, remove the human from the system so that the system can be more Becomes reliable. Real, more we'll, we'll fall apart. <laughs> right, right, right. You're gonna, but, you're gonna, like, you're gonna get VNJ. <laughs> Right. So hold on. What what I'm saying is like the automating everything, right? Like part of the, the big um, utopian statement is like we are going to get to the point where everything is like platform as a service or like managed services, which is potentially even better than platform as a service. And I just see this cycling in the last 10 years where we like we get a little bit closer and then we kind of take a step back and we discover that like it doesn't answer all the questions. So we, then we come up with a new solution, right? Kubernetes is a new solution to the same problem that we've solved already before that. And, and we're now now getting to commoditizing, but I like part of me is like, you know, and are we answering all the questions? I don't think we are. So, you know, who knows what's gonna come around the, the block and try to solve exactly the same problem again with a different, in a different shape or, or form, right? But I, I would add, and that was, I, I totally agree with you, Sasha. The other thing that's changed now from like the early days of platform as a service and the Heroku world is what I keep harping on is the rise of end user and co the collaboration with end users like Uber and Lyft and, you know, creating projects like Envoy. What we're seeing now rather than vendor driven initiatives or, you know, code dumps into open source repos that everybody, you know, gloms onto, not that that's what Kubernetes is, but um, there, you know, we're seeing much more co collaboration with the actual end users of these projects. So people from Netflix um, throwing Chaos Monkey and, uh, you know, tons of other projects into the open source world. And that is 
also the, a game changer for me. So we you know it's wonderful that um, OpenShift is has an open source distribution of it, OKD, which you know I will flagrantly promote whenever I can. Um, but I think the bigger thing for me is that has has changed games is the involvement of end users and not just us going out and asking for end user requirements and feedback on our projects, but this huge co-collaboration with end users um, like some of our customers, Amadeus and Anthem and other folks like that, that are really contributing back and contributing chunks of code sometimes right into the open source. So that has, so, so that gives me hope that we're just not going to iterate on the next technology and do this again and again and again. Though I kind of think we probably will do that too, because uh, <laughs> that's our nature. Um, but um, it gives me hope that whatever the next thing is after Kubernetes, um, that it that that will be something that we co-collaborate more closely with end users, um, and that they become um, some of the primary drivers of these open source projects, as opposed to vendor based. Which then again changes the relationship of vendors to end users because. Um, we always, you know, like to think of ourselves as the trusted partners who you come running to when you need a patch um, or a feature or a function. And instead, what we're getting is these huge code donations of things. Uh, I'm going to hit on um, Envoy um, for my example here, but that comes back in that we then incorporate into our products. So this symbiotic relationship with end users and vendors who are productizing and making services and managing services. Um, is new, I think. Um, yeah. it, it's I think early days of um, open source. There were a lot of individuals, um, education, you know, .edu's, and academics contributing to open source. But you know, then we saw this sort of phase of the corporatization of open source. Mm -hmm. um, I think, to me, and I, my hope is that we're in a new phase of open source development and co-collaboration and co-creation of um, these projects like Kubernetes and, where, and driving where it's going so that we get this evolution and ease of consumption because we're actually not just listening and asking for feedback, it's not feedback anymore, it's the feed. You know, the, it's, it's actually in the trough now, what we're eating and we're all eating the same dog food um, and hopefully it tastes better. But that's my opinion, humble as it may not be. So it's, it's, a, it's a knowledge sharing through code which I think is is definitely a much better situation than what we were in, say, 10 years ago. And and there's other things, right? We've automated a lot of toil out of the equation, and life was better, right, for operators. And so I can I can be proud that we were part of the DevOps Days movement that, you know, contributed to the whole thing happening. Um, but it's like, I think I think it brings me back also to the build versus buy and why you should you know do open like OpenShift as opposed to maybe vanilla right is like if you're doing Kubernetes because you want to put it on the on your resume and learn the skills then like do you know that it's essentially going to be useful in five years like are you absolutely sure <laughs> that this is the thing because like. I've I've had I've seen in my career I've seen technologies come and go and be completely retired and irrelevant and they say again Docker is a prime example for this like right it was all the rage and now it's gradually kind of being um, at least the runtime is gradually being phased out and so you know <laughs> yeah I think but I, you, know, you know like the build versus white question is is interesting because. Um, like for instance, Envoy and, and other things that we've mentioned here uh, are built on top of other technologies. So the question is, is your is your firm building something of value both to your firm and to the wider ecosystem? And can you identify what those are uh, and, and release them to enable uh, you know a be better competition in industry as opposed to uh, kind of the old version of kind of Chinese walls and things like this that that create false uh, scarcity and things like that. So I think I, you know I think open source uh, is becoming understood more and more as an actual strategic way of interacting with a market as opposed to like a source of free labor or uh, free code or something like that. Um, and that that becomes interesting. And you know then you can make arguments that say things like okay so. 
if you're interested in doing something where you're contributing, you're either creating something unique for your, your own organization or you're contributing something unique to the ecosystem, then maybe it actually makes a lot of sense to ask someone else to deal with um, the uh, operating parts of your system that don't have anything to do with creating that new value, that are just the baseline kind of everything below here is just standard stuff that needs to get wow. operated. Be nice for me not to have to spend a lot of time thinking about that. Certainly, it would be nice not to have to be patching that all the time. So the people that I have in my organization who are capable of developing new stuff aren't redeveloping and re, 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 retreading wheels that are, you know, you can just go to the store and buy the wheel these days. You don't need to tread it yourself, that type of stuff. Is a quote from someone um, that says, you don't want to be below the API, right? Like there's an API and once 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 something gets commoditized, like you can essentially consume something from an API, right? And you don't want to be below the API, you want to be above it and deliver actual value. Right. And it's, uh, you know, again, again, you know, from for me, from my perspective, from kind of a Wardley-ish perspective, that's not an ethical or a moral statement, right? That is a business statement. And it just says, actually, if you if, if the product is capable of operating at a commodity scale, also, the other thing that it needs is that scale. So, for instance, like if you have a company that only has like 5,000 servers in it, it's you don't get the same advantages that, for instance, Amazon gets for being able to operate 10,000 servers per operator because you don't have 10,000 servers, right? So you have to have a certain level of scale to even take economic advantage of commodity products that like as the seller right so i think, I think it's, it's important no, to say, that. yeah go ahead aaron sorry no, go. apologize the internet making it difficult to have conversations since the internet um so uh yeah i was just gonna get at um oh it's the worst is when you interrupt yourself and then lose the original thing you were gonna say uh Repeat the last thing you were talking about, and I'll get back to it. I was just ranting about uh, the economic value, the, uh, like the scale of the market that you oh, need. Oh, right, and you need that, you need that scale. Yeah, yeah, So uh, that was part of why I said uh, resource constraints is part of how making that decision, right? If, if you don't benefit from buying it, don't, don't buy it, right? Like there should be a benefit and, and reason to do that. It's just that more often than not, especially when you're talking about um, – ops targeted software, right? Things that are operational, things that are all about helping you do the thing over and over again, repeatedly in the same way. Almost always you're gonna get some benefit of buying someone else's expertise, right? There are asterisks and exceptions to everything, but you know, once you get to a certain point, almost always that, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Because it's, you know, not just buying, you're buying that method, you're buying all the research, you're buying all their maintenance and, and all of that goes into the price of software that we buy. Uh, and I think the, the open source lends itself towards, this was something else I was just thinking about. The, uh, what I really like about the open source method is the way it lets us um, explore a lot of different options, right? There's sort of that back and forth and that we're doing, the name, we're doing the same thing over again. It's because we can explore 10 different things uh, at once from an, uh, see which one might be better, say, oh, it looks like you know, Kubernetes is the way to go. We might find out, oh, there's this limitation that it has that won't let us whatever, I don't know what the weird next abstraction is that we're not gonna be able to do, right? Whatever that is. Uh, and then maybe we have to go back to the drawing board and figure out how do we do this again that allows us to break through that, that barrier, right? Like where natural evolution requires an advantage all the time, like always moving up so you can get stuck on plateaus. When we're talking about software and like designed evolution, like we can step backwards in order to make a further gain. That's something humans can do that won't happen naturally, right? The other thing I say really quickly is that one of the other things that I think uh, tends towards this commodity scale based problem uh, becoming more prevalent in organizations is because organizations are reaching a threshold of complexity that makes yeah. it necessary. Right. So I think you go to a modern bank uh, these days, if you if you roll scroll back in time to where um, where where uh, uh, Google starts um, with uh, with Borg, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at the complexity of Google at that point, and you look at the complexity of an average bank. Google's going to be a lot more complex at that point <laughs> than, that, than your average bank. And what's happened is that basically Google has kept continued to become more and more complex, 
but the banks have arrived at the same level of complexity that made Google need to have something like Borg to operate anymore. Right, right. And so that's what you're seeing is it's not like, you know, it's not that the demand for things like this is artificial or it, this isn't just resume driven development type stuff anymore. Some of these problems are problems that are newly introduced into organizations because they've arrived at a certain level of complexity. And the question is whether or not they can either internally adapt fast enough or if they need to ask for help operating something that is incredibly complex in a way. Yeah. I'm going to put one more plug in for open source and um, why, because because that's who I am. Um, and one of the things in the build versus buy consideration is when you're buying something that you just get the binary or you just get the API for and you don't get the code, um, you don't get to explore and co-collaborate with the people you're buying with. And I think one of the things, and I know I'm going to probably sound biased because I at Red Hat or anything, but I've been like this forever. So um, pre, pre Red Hat, but I think one of the things that's really important in the build versus buy consideration is when you're buying, m ensuring that you have access to the source code. Um, you may not want to build it yourself. You know, uh, we just did an OKD workshop all weekend last Saturday where everybody walked through building OKD four, and it wasn't fun. You know, <laughs> but people did it for their home labs in five different flavors. You know, so you know. These things, you know, but everybody was learning together, right? So um, I think one in the build versus buy consideration, sometimes the conversation about um, the importance of open source or at least open code um, and access to that to learn from it, um, I think it needs to be emphasized a little bit heavier because you can, you can log into um, EKS or wherever, but you may never get to see the tweaks and things that they did and you don't learn from it. It's not that I want to force Amazon to open source everything they do on their Fargate and you know, whatever it is, right? Um, it's just that that if we want to create the co-collaboration out there in the universe that's going to drive all of this innovation forward, um, we need access to that source code, which is, I think, one of the, the key value points of open source. Um, so, anyways, that that's my um, podium, and I'm, I'm getting on it. Um, I I'm looking at the time here. Um, I would like to give Aaron um, the last word. So, um, oh, wow. where do you think we're going from here? I, and the other thing I wanted to make you talk about a little bit is this black belt thing that you and Sasha are <laughs> too. So, tell us a little bit about being a black belt, what that means in DevOps, and where that came about. Uh, great. This is going to be awesome. This is where I explain it. And then Sasha says, no, you got it wrong after I get off the call. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is, uh, for, for Red Hat, our, our managed open shift black belt folks are, uh, part of the sort of extremely technical group of folks that help with implementation inside of, uh, the sales org, right? So on the one hand, you might have like developer advocates that reach out directly to broad community. Uh, we get to do some of that inside of specific, like, really big customers where they have developers the size of the entire rest of the community, right? Like, they might have 2,000 developers that are available all trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, so we get a little bit more targeted and help do enablement for, like, those groups. So I might go into a large customer and deliver a talk like this or talk about Kubernetes and the future of where it's going or help them with some of the technical implementation details of, like, hey, how do we get this working on OpenShift? We've been trying to do this and it's not working. Can you point me in the right direction? So very much sort of a targeted, very similar developer advocate uh, type roles, but a little bit more targeted at some of those big customers that sometimes don't get out of their own way and end up creating their own very big gravity of culture that draws all their own developers internal. So we kind of get to jump in there and help change that landscape. Did he get it right, Sasha? Yeah, I, th I think it's a good definition. It's a, you know what I mean? Like, it, as many people as many <laughs> right. opinions, but like, this is a pretty good definition of where we're going for. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I always try to figure out, like, there's one definition I can tell to someone who has, like, organizational context of where we're at. There's another definition when I'm explaining it to a broad uh, community of people. So, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and I think you make the point by, by going deep diving in with some of these end user and customers um, and having the, the source code to show them how these things mm -hmm. work. This is where this co-collaboration um, comes out, and and it and that I think yeah. we're seeing more and more of this, more of it in the open, more of it in you know 
gigs that you guys do one on one with companies, but more of this is happening out in the open. And I think that's the evolution that's happening right now in mm -hmm. open source. Um, and, you know, obviously um, it's being, you know, fed by uh, end users, by the foundations, by the vendors, by the partners and the cloud hosting providers. So it, it's really this amazing ecosystem. Um, and keeping it open um, and transparent and accessible is, is key for everybody's success. So um, kudos to you, Aaron, because that was one of the best presentations on this topic I've ever seen. Um, someday I'm going to make you do a keynote for me at um, <laughs> KubeCon uh, in the five minutes or less. You're going to have to compact this down. Um, so uh, yeah, start thinking that way. The that, very short version of this talk. The yeah. very, very short version <laughs> of this. Uh, um, so yeah, because I would love to see the reaction to um, like a whole KubeCon audience to yeah, yeah. Um, Vanilla, because those are, those are the ones that I think a lot of the folks in the room there have a, a mythical belief that mm -hmm. Vanilla Kubernetes is what they want um, versus the reality of what when they go back home to their organizations, what they're um, able to do. So um, yeah, and 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 again, kudos to Sysdig and everybody else who does it. Um, that this is not saying you shouldn't do it. It's just saying you better be prepared when you do do it. So um, absolutely, yeah. So hopefully we'll get you all back on again um, soon and um, keep talking through some of these topics. And um, Jabe and Sasha, thank you for joining us today. And Chris Short, kudos to you for um, making this happen and um, broadcasting it out to the universe. And I'll post the video. And um, if you go back to your resources link. Throw that to uh, the last page and we will um, share the slides and any other resources too. Yeah, let me, uh, so it's all it's all pretty straightforward. Speaking.crazy.com uh, will be where all my slide stuff ends up. Uh, so if you've got that, this deck should be up and published with resources now. Uh, so you should be able to find that there and uh, yeah. We'll throw the video up shortly, too. So thanks again, and take care. Everybody have a great weekend. Enjoy it. Happy Friday. You too. Thank you thanks. for the invite. Bye-bye.